Okay, so warm well, welcome everyone to the next afternoon of the discourse program of CTM Festival. I'm Anita Yori, a co-curator of this discourse program, and I'm also a research associate at Berlin University of the Arts, and I'm going to host this afternoon. Maybe some words about the program today. Uh, the main focus of this afternoon will be on, on spiritual practices and rituals that evolve in liminal spaces, and there will be three inputs on that topic. The first one is going to be more like a theoretical lecture by Graham St. John, and the second uh, lecture, or like more like a panel discussion, Discussion will be more like a practical something that gives you maybe a little more input from artistic perspectives because three artists will be on stage and Graham will moderate also this panel and they will give a little input on that how spirituality plays a role in their artistic practices and the third part of this afternoon and I've just heard it from uh, the organizers in the background that we have to be really sharp on time today will be a meditation, like a sound bath meditation session. So we have to be very careful with the time today and this afternoon to bring out all the chairs around 5 p.m. when it will start with Lucy. So I will just say some words about our first uh, presenter, Graham St. John. He's a cultural anthropologist specializing in festivals, neo tribes, and entheogens. Graham has recently finished his research on Burning Man at the Department of Social Sciences, University of Freiburg, Switzerland. And just to mention two titles, let's say, from his altogether eight books, Global Tribe, Technology, Spirituality, and Psytrans, and maybe another one, Technoma Technomad, Global Raving, Countercultures. And there are a couple of other books he also edited, for example, Weekend Societies, Electronic Dance Music Festivals, and even Cultures, or to mention maybe another one, Rave Culture and Religion. So from all those titles, I think you can all guess it that he's highly interested in religious practices and spirituality in music cultures. And another important information about Graham, I think, is that he's also an uh, executive editor of Dance Cult, Journal of Electronic Dance Music Culture, which I would say also one of the most important platforms for electronic dance music research at the moment. So I'm giving directly the microphone to Graham to start his lecture, and the title is Superliminal Transformational Vibes from Psytrans to Burning Man. Graham, the stage is yours. Okay. Oh, and I'm, my mic is working. Wonderful. Thank you, Anita. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here on the uh, 21st uh, birthday of CTM, which I just discovered. Um, uh, I, I thank, for, thank you to all the staff who've uh, been very helpful bringing me here. So yes, um, the superliminal. Uh, I've often referred to myself as uh, a vibologist because I've uh, been uh, living in and breathing and uh, studying the vibe. So, uh, or as um, in these parts, it's referred to as the vibe. And uh, so I'll be, uh, I hope you're strapped in because uh, we'll uh, take a little bit of a journey through the vibe and more particularly uh, um, uh, a couple of movements, most notably Burning Man, and Anita mentioned that I've been re researching Burning Man. It's not, uh, it's not a project that's really finished. I don't think you can really finish uh, researching Burning Man. It's probably a lifelong uh, research. But um, I'll be making reference to psychedelic trance and Burning Man as to, mostly Burning Man, as to uh, event, transformational event cultural movements that have evolved liminality and have evolved the vibe to uh, what I refer to as a, a sort of superliminal uh, aesthetic. And um, so I'm interested in how event cultures and, and sort of transformational movements evolve uh, the liminal conditions that are, that are optimized through, um, through uh, uh, potentiating uh, events through sensory technologies and, and participatory arts. And so I'll, I'll be looking at how um, these superliminal movements um, evolve and impact uh, culture and society beyond uh, the event space. And so, ultimately, looking at how transformation—I mean, if if uh, 
liminal conditions or the, the I mean, as some of you may know, liminality comes from the Latin word limen, which means uh, threshold. And so if uh, a threshold is a space of potential, it's also a space of potential transformation. And if Burning Man and other events are spaces of transformation, they are, uh, transformation is very complicated in, in these environments. So I'll be looking at um, what I also call hyperliminal uh, characteristics of, uh, of these transformational event spaces. So the vibe is uh, something that most of you know, but uh, viscerally, but um, also have difficulty articulating. And uh, it's, it's a sociosonic aesthetic that holds currency across all dance and festival scenes and, and, and cultures. Ravers, clubbers and festival goers the world over claim to be more alive on the dance floor than any other space and time in their life. Uh, it most commonly denotes an optimal social dance music experience, and uh, here we have S Sally Summer, who makes a valiant effort to define the vibe. I think that uh, among my favorite theorists, Victor Turner's concept of communitas gets close to uh, understanding what uh, uh, you know, to make sense of this experience as a, as a flash of mutual understanding on the existential level and a gut understanding of synchronicity. And it's uh, spontaneous communitas or existential communitas. So I've been interested in how sensory technologies, audio, visual, chemical, are designed to assist and access and augment these conditions, which for many people uh, correspond to a, a religious experience. So I want to look at some of the characteristics of the vibe. Um, it, the, one of the core characteristics is that, that it encourages creativity. It, uh, it's co-creative, minimizes, uh, you know, a good vibe is uh, a space where the separation between artists and audience uh, is minimized. And, and here we have an example of uh, how uh, a dance floor can be structured, uh, and this is a uh, beloved, beloved festival in, in Oregon, as opposed to um, Tomorrowland uh, in, in uh, Belgium here, which is a great classic example of a spectacle where uh, the, the godlike DJ uh, takes its place on stage and you have uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands, maybe up to 100,000 people uh, focused on uh, one individual on stage. You couldn't get a gulf uh, uh, much wider here between the DJ and everyone else. Um, another aspect is that uh, a, good, a vibe or an evolved vibe is both ecstatic and principled. Um, I appreciated uh, Tara Hill's presentation the other day, she talked about uh, various aspects of the, the ecstatic nature of, uh, of raving and uh, festival culture. Uh, festival cultures and, and dance cultures are enable the transcendence of rules, codes and, and regulation. They enable you to go out of your mind. Uh, at Burning Man, they call it radical self-expression. Uh, it's not a photo of Burning Man, but on the other hand, uh, evolved and mature uh, event cultures are, are principled, and uh, Burning Man has uh, ten principles. It's an evolved ethos, an evolved philosophy. The founder of Burning Man, Larry Harvey, once told me that at Burning Man, philosophy is more than just a hood ornament. Uh, it's an event organization where you have tens tens of thousands of volunteers, or at least 10, 15,000 people who volunteer um, uh, across the event. Uh, another facet is that uh, cultures of the vibe are ideally radically inclusive, meaning that identity is defined in authentic expressions of the self, not pr primarily via nationality, religion, and ethnicity. Uh, belonging and stature is established not by one's attitude towards an external other by which one defines self-identity, but from immediate interaction uh, with fellow participants. 
Now, of course, within psychedelic trance and Burning Man, this is a contentious notion because uh, uh, it, it's all very well to say that um, these uh, spaces are radically I inclusive, but they're also uh, uh, characterized by the relative absence of uh, people, with people of color, which is a, a, a mounting concern within the Burning Man organization. Um, these are event-centered communities, and uh, I've drawn upon French sociologist Michel Maffasoli's concept of neo-tribes. Uh, event cultures provide meaning, identity, and purpose independent from traditional sources of uh, identification, such as family, church, and state. So in my book, which was published 10 years ago now, so it's I've, I've noted every year how dated it's become. However, uh, there is, I think, still some value in, in this book, uh, particularly with regard to uh, the effort to characterize different uh, vibe sensibilities or different uh, sociosonic aesthetics that I've, uh, I've characterized under various sort of ideal states, uh, Dionysian outlaw, exile, reclamational, and so on, down to activist. Um, and, and noting that these various aesthetics of freedom and responsibility and identification are, are often uh, uh, interlayered and intermeshed. And I just want to note a couple of examples um, of, an, for example, the an outlaw vibe. So, if you may know of uh, the Castle Morton event in the UK in '92, which was uh, involves uh, Spiral Tribe and other sound systems at the relocated Avon Free Festival on Cam Castle Morton Common. This was arguably the first technival, and I say it's outlaw because uh, Spiral Tribe and other outfits there were um, amplifying uh, uh, beats that were um, uh, 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 illegal, uh, according to the Public Order and uh, Criminal Justice Act that came into uh, came into uh, power as, a, uh, as an act in, in 1994, I believe. Uh, uh, they were emanating um, uh, beats that were characterized by uh, uh, repetitive beats. Um, I've got that wrong, but something like that. Uh, an, an example of a reclamational uh, vibe, actually not so far from here, I was at uh, the uh, Sonics gathering at the Centrum Clapperfeld in, in Frankfurt in uh, 2013, where I was giving a presentation about DMT. And um, it's a very good example of how uh, Germans have, uh, have excelled in reclaiming space. This is a uh, former Gestapo prison, and of course, there was a club in the basement. And of course, uh, as many of you know, the Fusion Festival, I think, is one of the best examples of reclaiming um, space. Uh, the event is held in a former Soviet air base uh, and uh, features uh, dozens of camouflaged hangars that were formerly the you know, housing weapons of war and have now been repurposed. And, uh, and reclaimed for uh, as spaces of pleasure and, uh, and joy. Uh, just an example of uh, spiritual vibe, which is uh, the dome here at Azora Festival in Hungary. The dome is a, a chill space, uh, a, an advanced space for enabling uh, participants to go out of their minds and uh, to transcend their, themselves. Uh, it's a highly optimized uh, spiritual technology. And of course, Azora is sort of downstream from uh, Goa, which uh, intriguingly started uh, on a beach, which is uh, a very liminal space in itself. A beach is, uh, this is a full, moon, a full moon party in 76, which was an annual event for seasonal travelers to Goa through 70s and 80s. Uh, 90s, uh, even in, in some respects up to the present, uh, but really taking its really peaking as an electronic scene in the late 80s, early 90s, 
Uh, the beach is a liminal space. It's uh, neither land nor sea. It's uh, in between, and so it's a space of possibility. And I find it intriguing that uh, an entire movement uh, evolved from this liminal space. So we have events like Boom's Port uh, Portugal's Boom Festival, which is uh, kind of a festivalization of, of Goa. It's kind of a, a weak uh, condensation of uh, a season in Goa. They even have uh, they even orchestrate this event during a full moon, so that uh, it, uh, it 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 carries that uh, Goa state of mind. And in my book, Global Tribe, I uh, study this festivalization of, of, uh, of, of Goa liminality and the Goa state of mind. Uh, and the other event that I'll focus on uh, also started on a beach, a liminal space, in, in uh, 1986, when uh, Larry Harvey, as a result of a broken heart, uh, had a cathartic ritual where he and some friends uh, burnt a eight-foot uh, effigy on Baker Beach. And this ritual became uh, increasingly popular over the, the, the next four years and uh, until the, they got, got so big that they were uh, unable to burn the... The police disallowed the burning of the effigy in 1990 when they were assisted by uh, the San Francisco Cacophony Society, who are a group of urban exploration, explorationists and pranksters and flash mobbers who were uh, formative in culture jamming and, and billboard improvements, um, and inspired by French playwrights and puppeteer Alfred Jerry, who uh, was from the founders of Dada, and uh, they were instrumental in bringing Burning Man to the desert. And in 1990, an event called Zone Trip Number no. 4. And uh, they performed a number of these zone trips, which were inspired by uh, Tarkovsky's film Stalker and the, his idea of the zone. And they took, and in, in the Black Rock Desert, they saw uh, a whole lot of potential and they burned the man there for the first time in 1990. So Burning Man happens on, on a, a special uh, place called the Playa. Uh, it's a, the Playa is a flat forward bottom of an undrained ba desert basin that becomes at times a shallow lake. Also means beach in Spanish. And uh, it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's a space that is... Uh, Scorching by day and freezing at night, uh, the spaces are very harsh, harsh conditions. I've taken a lot of interest in uh, geographer Bill Fox's idea of isotropic space. Uh, uh, for him, the, the player, and especially the Black Rock Desert player, is uh, exemplary isotropic space, which is a, a space that uh, features that are uniformly distributed in, in all directions. And for him, uh, Burning Man is an expression of the, the possibilities provoked by cognitive dissonance in isotropic spaces. So isotropic spaces are a particular form of extreme liminality, if you like, or radical liminality. So Fox has written that in such spaces you can feel as if by being radically diminished in size, uh, you, you, are, you are more properly scaled to the planet. It seems as if your mind expands to fill the space around you an eerie and nearly hallucinogenic experience. The spaces are sublime, they're beautiful and yet dangerous. They're also a blank canvas. And uh, for artists who have gravitated to this space, uh, it has represented uh, a space of possibility. A, a natural tabula rasa and uh, a remote place that is also a radically in-between space and time uh, is a quintessentially, quintessential realm of pure possibility, as Victor Turner would say, which is essentially his shorthand for liminality, a realm of pure possibility. So this is the space where Black Rock City evolved and by 96, it's 8,000 people and uh, 
you know, up to uh, present day, it's 80,000 80, people. And this, you see how this uh, space evolved rituals, notably the ritual of burn night, which has evolved as, a, as I guess, the world's most uh, spectacular fire performance. And so I was taking an interest in how this whole phenomenon has grown and into a global network. So uh, these days there's uh, upwards of 90, more than 90 uh, official Burning Man regional events around the world. And uh, these are events that are, you know, officially endorsed by the Burning Man project in that they uh, sort of comply with the, the 10 principles. So I've recently been involved in a project at uh, the University of Fribourg in Switzerland called Burning Progeny, where we've been uh, undertaking a collaborative comparative ethnography of uh, Burning Man regional events in Europe and also Israel. And uh, we've been exploring this, uh, the, the evolution of this liminal culture. And here we have uh, pictures of uh, events, in, events, including a uh, kids burn here in the top, top left, uh, a G German event. And uh, in the top right is nowhere in Spain. Uh, bottom right is Midburn in Israel. And, uh, and, and I'm sorry, the bottom left is Kisburn. And uh, the top left is uh, Dragonburn in China. In the middle is um, the Borderland, which is a Swedish uh, Nordic event that's been held in Denmark. So that there are. There are many examples of, uh, that I don't have time for uh, of uh, these regional events around the world that, and other offshoots uh, events that have been inspired by Burning Man in various respects, including uh, something that might be familiar to some of you because uh, this, is a, this is Baboon Island, or which has been renamed Baboon Island as a former bridge, uh, the remnants of a former bridge in, uh, in the River Spree, which uh, can be viewed from the bridge not far from here. And uh, this is one of the uh, activities of the Berlin chapter of the Cacophony Society. Uh, recently uh, emerged and they've uh, raised, raised a uh, uh, monolith uh, in the middle of a spree. And um, we may see other monoliths appearing around the city. So I've taken a lot of interest in the evolution of dance music culture in The Burning Man and uh, written quite a bit on that. And um, here we can see uh, the evolution from uh, kind of rave era, uh, we don't care where the DJ is, to uh, a spectacular performance where you have upwards of maybe 15,000 people focused on one DJ at the Opulent Temple. Uh, one of the large dance camps at Burning Man in 2014. Um, I've also taken an interest, a lot of interest in what's called mutant vehicles, uh, which are highly optimized uh, liminal objects uh, and liminal vehicles. Uh, the Disco Duck was one of my favorites. It's uh, a mobile three-level club in the form of a yellow bath time duck. But what intrigued me was that this, is, uh, this object has been uh, constructed upon the chassis of an armored amphibious assault vehicle, so it's a very good example of uh, uh, a repurposing of, uh, of objects, and, um, in, and notably in this case, uh, 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 a military object, uh, uh, an artifice of, of war into an artifice of pleasure. Um, Now, some, some of these uh, mutant vehicles have become controversial. This is the Danstronauts, who were quite popular in Black Rock City uh, from about 2013 to 2016. And uh, they became very popular, but also quite controversial there. Uh, the Danstronauts consist of the strip ship, a spaceship with a sky deck that rises 40 feet in a hydraulic scissor lift with the likeness of uh, the man in LED. It, uh, tows a, it, it tows a, a custom-built stage with a 100,000-watt sound system called the Base Station with 
which features a DJ booth and dance podiums typically occupied by what are known as the dance jihadis. There were n multiple issues that um, were uh, associated with the dance genauts. They were notorious for ignoring sound regulations and disturbing other art projects. They were seen to commodify the Burning Man experience, preoccupied with creating a brand. Uh, their website promises that the company delivers all of the hottest mainstream electronic dance music, top 100 favorites and more. And of course, they were also reinforcing um, hegemonic gender norms and perpetuating narrow and impossible to achieve standards of beauty. Uh, so they, they embodied many of the, the fraught characteristics of uh, superliminalization. And as, but intriguingly, as a result of that, um, some of these issues, they were uh, disqualified to register as a mutant vehicle in, uh, I think in, in, in 2016 and 2017. So it did show that the, the community process uh, did work. But my, my favorite uh, liminal vehicle uh, is the, and, and certainly a winner in the attention economy of Burning Man is the Space Cowboys uh, MOG, Unimog which is uh, uh, 73 Mercedes-Benz uh, military radio vehicle. It's re repurposed as a sound art car. Uh, it's equipped with amplifier cabinets, fold-out subwoofers, front-mounted three-way speakers, video screens, and a, a domed DJ booth. It's noted to be the largest off-road off sound system in the world. Uh, and it was not only the first mutant vehicle in Black Rock City it was the first to accommodate turntables and use an uh, FM transmitter, which enabled them to link up with other uh, sound art vehicles and uh, amplify uh, uh, one, one DJ's performance through uh, multiple units. And I think I have uh, just a short video of the MOG, if we have time. We might need some sound. So I've got sound here, and it's plugged in. So you gotta crunch it. Uh, Kirk Martin. I'm uh, also known as Captain Kirk, uh, one of the Space Cowboy DJs. I've been DJing with Space Cowboys for about 14 years. It's basically, you know, a collective of friends and engineers, artists, kind of people from all different types of backgrounds that originally came together going to Burning Man and they got, you know, involved with trying to make cool art projects. We decided to buy this vehicle and transformed it over a summer and brought it out to Burning Man. It's like driving a big turtle. <laughs> a little slow, but once you get up and go, it's uh, pretty good. It's got quite a bit of weight to it, so it has a little bit of a little bit of a rock to it. Uh, driving a boat. <laughs> this truck used to be an old military radio truck. The MOG originally came from the idea that we would be able to. Uh, help our friends um, bring awareness to their projects, give them the ability to have a little bit more exposure. Originally it was just covered with a bunch of TVs and it was just a crazy looking mutant audio assault vehicle as we like to call it. It was sort of the first art car at Burning Man that kind of went, oh let's do something different and put sound on it, not to like blast people's ears out but to entertain us and make sure that we had a good time. People like to get together and celebrate, you know, after working really hard or having a rough life or having a rough week. Like, you know, dance floors are a lot of ways that people get together in San Francisco. And by creating this truck, we kind of made a mobile dance floor that we can take, take it on the road and take it anywhere.
Okay, so uh, just some brief comments about hyperliminality now that we've learned a little about superliminality. Uh, Burning Man is also uh, multitudinous and contested. Uh, there, the event attracts uh, a heterogeneous population carrying manifold expectations and intentions. And groups and organizations who operate across varied principles and aesthetics, uh, such as the Department of Public Works, which is uh, one of the largest volunteer organizations at Burning Man, and essentially a uh, very punk-rooted uh, uh, group that build and dismantle Burning Man, somewhat as opposed to uh, some of the, the rave-orientated or rave-derived uh, dance camps, such as the, uh, the uh, Robot Heart, uh, pictured here. Robot Heart went on to form uh, their own events, but they still have a presence at Burning Man. Uh, two other organizations, uh, uh, sort of neo-tribes present in, in uh, Black Rock City are the Rangers and uh, various law enforcement bodies, and we're talking about organizations that have uh, quite uh, contested uh, views of what Burning Man means. And these are uh, uh, examples of uh, the, some of the, the groups that, uh, that uh, compose a hyperliminal environment. One of the interesting things about Burning Man, though, is that it uh, it it is uh, it features many art projects that are uh, are dr dramatic in the way that art and ritual intentionally plays with uh, the paradox and uh, serves a redressive purpose in, in a period of crisis. So, and the crisis being when the event is. Uh, uh, almost overrun by people who uh, are more or less tourists or who are, um, have come for the wrong reasons, such as you know, seeing their favorite DJ in the, the, the sickest background. And one of the art projects that, that intrigued me the most in the realm of mutant vehicles was the bleachers. I'll just show a quick video of the ble bleachers. intrigues me about this is that uh, this, this is an art project that intentionally plays with uh, the paradox of, uh, uh, of spectating and performing. Uh, are you a spectator or are you a performer if you're uh, sitting in a, in a set of sports bleachers that's uh, mobile and uh, touring around the, uh, the Black Rock Desert? As, as one of the Vancouver-based uh, creators of this uh, object said, Eric Holt said, uh, maybe making people think a little bit about the paradox of spectating and creating and the interplay between the two was uh, the inspiration for, for this uh, object in a time when Burning Man was, uh, when, when more and more virgins and people who were coming as spectators were, uh, were coming to Burning Man. So the, these examples of, uh, of uh, various groups that occupy this environment are and, and installations and art projects that converge in this environment uh, give uh, meaning to what uh, Michel Foucault referred to as a heterotopic space. And um, I don't really have a lot of time to go into that. I've, uh, you see that I'm uh, about to publish an article that's referenced there that uh, draws attention to uh, some of these uh, conflicts and these uh, dramatic heterotopian uh, efforts to uh, redress uh, 
some of the problems that uh, Burning Man has faced in recent times. And I think that what Foucault uh, was trying to find, what trying to get out there in heterotopia was this definition of an impossible space as a, as a flower in the desert, as an ephemeropolis, a theatre of creative destruction, of exclusive inclusives, inclus exclusive inclusivities. Black Rocksivity may well be the living evidence of that impossible space. Um, also, something else I don't have much time to address is another organisation spun out of uh, this environment is Burners Without Borders. Uh, Burners Without Borders was founded in 2005 as a community-led NGO which initiates civic work projects and disaster relief in uh, local communities around the globe. And as I, as I uh, come towards the end, um, a project that I was involved in last year which will be, uh, will attempt to optimize this year is the Vibometer. Uh, this is an example of uh, how a liminal space breeds incongruous objects or performance props. The vibometer is a nine-foot pole with multimodal LED sequences on the stem and globe. It's very much inspired by uh, Dada and pataphysics. I mean, the, the idea of measuring the vibe is about as absurd as measuring poetry. And um, it's also inspired by, uh, it's kind of lucky coincidence that uh, Alfred Jarry, who's the, considered to be one of the founders of Dada and uh, the, the coiner of the, the concept of pataphysics, is a, pataphysics is a theme that's inspired this year's uh, Burning Man theme. And uh, so, We'll be working to uh, explore this a little bit further. Liminal objects dwell at the intersection of science and, and art. Uh, so we, we, had the, uh, we had a lot of fun giving people the uh, illusion that their, their dance movements were being registered and uh, captured by us as uh, social scientists. Um, there's a small video. It's also very practical because um, you know, it, it's inspired by what in Australia is referred to as doof sticks, which uh, doof means a party in Australia, and I realize that in this country, uh, it means something else. Uh, it means uh, stupid and dumb. Uh, but a doof stick is uh, like a, a talisman. It's, very, it's also very practical. It enables your friends to find you on a dance floor, which is uh, maybe consists of uh, tens of thousands of people. So uh, this year we're exploring the idea of going remote control to uh, explore those, uh, explore the liminal uh, conjunction of uh, science and art and, uh, and also it's a comment on uh, you know not taking ourselves too seriously as uh, as researchers so just to finish it off um, in, in 2016 the burning man project purchased uh, a 3800 acre property in nevada called fly ranch uh, it, it seems to demonstrate the, the maturation of a liminal culture uh, this project is uh, an incubator. There are many possible projects uh, on the drawing boards, such as a, a desert art park, an energy incubator, an organic farm, a botanical garden, a site for interactive teaching and learning, a burning man laboratory, a, a healing center, maker space, an event venue, a sustainable model for community, community living. You can see here that uh, this land is not that far from uh, the Black Rock Desert Playa. So I'll just uh, end, end this with uh, a couple of questions. What is the future for a community experienced in organizing temporary events on government land who now own land for permanent projects? And what will become of the transformative 
liminal potency of Burning Man as its regional events have blown further and further from the playa. Thanks very much. Questions from the audience? Hi, thank you very much for your presentation and your fascinating work. I was thinking, I mean, it seems to me there are like two approaches or two ways to conceptualize the transformational powers of rave cultures. While the first one tends to emphasize self-expression, like uh, authentic self-expression or radical self-expression, as it's called in the principles of Burning Man. Um, and I mean, that might imply the idea that every individual comes to the dance floor with something that must be expressed, and then you express it and something happens because of that. And then the second approach, quite different, I think, may be more common in certain attempts to write about like the Berlin techno scene. Um, it's not so much about individual expression, but those writings tend to more um, emphasize what happens when you synchronize body movements in a dark dance floor, or how you submit yourself to the music, and the music is also typically quite maybe darker. Uh, sometimes also with like a more political take on how dance cultures collectively challenge like temporal rhythms of official society or challenge the right to the city or so on. So my question is, if you agree that these are like two possible tendencies in, in conceptualizing this, are these then just two theoretical approaches aiming at the same thing or do they describe different tendencies within dance culture with maybe different music or different drugs or different dancing styles, different implications for politics or spirituality? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good comment and question. I, I think it's really important to... Uh, you know, it, it's hard to generalise, and uh, so in, in my book Technomad, I, as, a, as an ethnographer, I, even though I, I, it's also a cultural history, it was, I found it very important to focus on particular uh, dance cultural uh, communities and what their uh, sensibilities were and, and what their motives were and whether they're, you know, for instance, uh, I didn't make a lot of uh, reference here to what I've been referring to as reactionary or, or um, activist you know, tribes or vibe tribes, but um, there's uh, the, the, the intention is uh, really core and I think that um, the, these aesthetics really evolve with intention. So, um, but of course, there, there's if you have a activist tribes and, and vibe tribes, if you like, who are motivated by particular causes, those those aren't necessarily self-sustaining because they'll they'll uh, attempt to achieve uh, the end goal of those causes. Um, so I don't think there's um, a uh, short and quick answer to your question. I think that these aesthetics are, are uh, cross-layered, and I think we need to focus on particular examples. Yes, yes there's another one. Yes, hello. Um, I, I have a little bit the feeling that the Cytran scene and the Burning Man scene are very, very different uh, and are going in different directions uh, culturally. Uh, whereas see the Cytran scene is more going towards a co commercial event, whereas Burning Man have uh, yeah, the Ten Commandments that will actually manifest themselves into a thriving uh, uh, self, um, what is called self-created culture. It has more potential to actually be a collective culture rather than Citron scene. I see more go towards a um, commercial area. Do you have any uh, own ideas about this? Yeah, I think uh, the broader 
view is correct, although I would say that a lot of burners would <laughs> correct you about the, the Ten Principles being Ten Commandments, um, because there is a very uh, self-directed uh, irony about the, the Ten Principles uh, sounding like the Ten Commandments. Um, Is that me? You won't find a lot of Psytrance uh, at Burning Man these days. There was there, it was there in the early days, but you will be hard pressed to uh, locate it. Um, and I guess that has reflected the evolution of Psytrance, become more commercialized over the years. But that, again, that's hard to, uh, you know, generalize because in most countries you have underground scenes. Um, and, uh, but you won't necessarily find those underground, uh, you know, Psytrance scenes at, at Burning Man. Yeah, Burning, Burning Man and, and, and Psytrance have, uh, even though they, they, they were both born on beaches, have, uh, uh, have grown involved in, in, uh, and matured in, in different ways. But um, it's very difficult to, as I say, um, uh, generalize about Psytrance because, of course, the, there's a spectrum of events and communities uh, right across the globe from, uh, you know, un underground uh, communities to uh, highly commercial operations. And even many of the highly commercial operations like Boom are like Burning Man. They don't have corporate sponsorship uh, and uh, are uh, exemplary in many respects in terms of uh, uh, evolving events that are e ecologically sound, ecologically sound principles. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question somewhat. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, for, to my knowledge, the tickets for Burning Man read go up to $1,500. So how radically inclusive can a festival be with that kind of a price tag on top? I mean, you showed us a good timeline of the evolution. It was born on a beach with about, you know, 50 or 100 participants, and now you have like 80,000. Um, so, yeah, how radically inclusive can a festival be with that kind of a price tag? Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, the, 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 the ticket tiers do go up to uh, something like that. I think most of the tickets are around uh, four or five hundred dollars. Um, yeah, it, it's, an, it's an event that uh, discludes uh, a, a great many people, and uh, increasingly so. And uh, many people regard Burning Man as a, as a bucket list event. It's the, it's the one thing they will do in their, hope to do in their lives, if they're lucky enough to get a ticket. It's also an event of, extreme, uh, of extremes. Uh, the, the hardcore of Burning Man are the, the Department of Public Works, uh, these people who are, many of whom will, not, they don't pay for the ticket, they will, many of whom will be issued a ticket and will volunteer and, and also have paid positions. Uh, and so uh, the research that I, I've been uh, involved in is an effort to uh, uh, understand how uh, an event like Burning Man survives through these extremes and, and how the community itself addresses these extremes through uh, various measures such as um, providing low-income tickets. Uh, there is an increasing number of low-income tickets available this year. And uh, doing things like um, preventing um, outside services. And we were talking about an event where nothing is bought or sold on site other than uh, water and, uh, and ice and coffee uh, and some essential services. Uh, so it's an event that is, you know, decommodification de is one of the principles of Burning Man, but uh, clearly this is not an event that operates outside of the market. It's not an event that operates outside of um, uh, opportunity structures. Um, 
but it is an event that draws attention to commodification and attempts to uh, address the ways that art is commodified. And one of the things that fascinates me is the, the projects, the art projects that uh, evolve as, uh, uh, you know, as liminal objects within this environment that are, attempt to redress uh, some of those points of contention. Um, hello, thank you. Um, this question is maybe a bit more in the abstract realm, but um, one of the things that I feel a lot when talking within especially the Berlin techno community, I would say that's more where I find myself. When you speak about religiosity or spirituality connected to, um, to these fields, there is a tendency towards cringing. I myself have experienced that. And I'm very curious whether in the um, more academic or other jargon, whether there is another way to address these topics, especially because religiosity tends to come with a certain set of rules, etc. And I don't think anyone wants to go into that um, zone of religiosity. I think it's something else that has to be talked, but uh, sometimes the terms or the words still elude or escape me, so I was wondering if there is anything that could be shared on that aspect. You know, one of the interesting things, just to go back to Burning Man, is that they have a, a, a census. They, they, they've been taking this census uh, for more than 10 years, and one of the questions on, on that census deals with religion and uh, I think the, by and large, the 70 to 80, 80 percent of the population of Black Rock City uh, identify as spiritual but not religious. So perhaps that's a sort of response to uh, uh, your, your question. There, there, there is a, I think there's a need to distinguish uh, religiosity and spiritual experience from uh, mainstream religion and monotheisms and, uh, you know, uh, hierarchical re religion. And I think that when, you know, I, I published a book called Rave Culture and Religion, and uh, that was an answered collection that addresses this very theme of, uh, you know, what, what, it, what, it, what is it that compels people to, uh, to return to the vibe and build the vibe and, and, and evolve it? Uh, what, what, what is motivating that? And um, I think that when you get down to the core of it, the, the motivation is, uh, uh, is, is a desire for transcendence and desire to you know, just transcend uh, uh, the self in, uh, in the company of others. And I think that uh, you know, we're getting close to a religious experience there, but it's not, it's not, the, it's not definable in terms of uh, monotheism or mainstream religion. So I think that most people who identify as spiritual but not religious would, would uh, identify with, with that, I think. Um, thank you for the... Input. Um, you were referring to these liminal spaces as transforming. Um, I, I don't get rid of the impression that it's also quite sustaining the, the default world uh, as a recreational space. So do you have studied on the effects or like what, what kind of changes then in the default world a part of like these limited events? Yes, yeah, so, well, I think your question is like, how, how does what happens in the post-liminal world? What, what is the impact of uh, an event in the, in the post-liminal world? Yes. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, could, uh, I mean, I could ask you. I mean, uh, um, I mean, I think everyone has their own answer to that because, I mean, most people here are involved in some communities that are different communities and uh, and you know, it's just fascinating to hear people's uh, you know stories and backgrounds and how what motivates them, not only to come back to the 
communities, the dance communities that they are involved with, or they they have some kind of artistic involvement with. Uh, but um, how that uh, that identification uh, impacts the world outside of those communities. But I think that that's an interesting question. But it comes down to the context again. Um, my interest has been in uh, Burning Man, and um, maybe it's a bit, bit, a bit Burner-centric, but um, I would like to see someone um, undertake, I think there's a, there's a lot of scope for uh, postgraduate research from your PhD on Burners Without Borders, because I think that Burners Without Borders is a great example of how uh, this liminal environment uh, has evolved to impact uh, the world. And uh, there's, there's a lot of scope for that in terms of uh, um, uh, I impacting the world outside of the, the event community. So maybe my question is then rather, what are the criteria that the event doesn't become like a bucket list um, uh, place for just for spectators? and what makes them quite, quite more impactus like that, um, that it keeps that burning spirit? I don't know, if you, if you find the, uh, the, the, the ingredients for that, let me know. Okay. Hello, thank you. Um, where do you see Burning Man and rave culture going in the uh, near future? Uh, five to ten years. Thank you. Oh, I get the easy questions uh, yeah, at the end. Um, it's a very good question. Uh, Burning, Burning Man, well, they've claimed that uh, Burning Man is like a hundred, hundred year project, and uh, uh, there's ideas that Black Rock City could cater for maybe a hundred thousand people. But really, the the thing about Burning Man is that it's become a global phenomenon. So uh, I've met more and more people who are uh, each year who've been exposed to the, the regional events who've never been to Black Rock City. And so what we're seeing now is more and more people who are identify with these communities, whether it's nowhere in Spain or any of the other European events, uh, who are interested in, in growing those events. We see events like Midburn, which uh, just last year attracted, or the year before, attracted 15,000 people in only its fifth year, and which was the you know, fastest growing, I guess, regional Burning Man event in the world, which you know, poses the question, what, what, why, is, why is that accelerated so, so much in Israel? What are, what are Israelis, what, what is part of their culture that's uh, invested into, into this? Um, I don't think that there are any simple answers for that. And so far as how, how rave uh, is evolving, um, uh, we, we've seen a lot of interesting things in, uh, in countries like Iran, and uh, um, I'm, uh, as Anita mentioned, I'm the executive editor of the of Dance Cult, um, and I, I, which is the Journal of Electronic Dance Music Culture, and we publish a journal, one issue, issue of that journal each year. It's a peer-reviewed uh, journal. We also have feature articles and, and what we call from the floor articles. And uh, I would encourage you and anyone else who's uh, researching rave and now in the future to uh, to submit to that article so we can find out exactly what's what's going on with rave in, in now and in the future. Thanks for the talk, Graham. So, liminality in urban life is what I just wanted to ask. Um, the, I think the least liminal area in Berlin is the Mercedes-Benz arena, dystopia. It's just, it's the most binary concrete nightmare. And, uh, and it seems that all the liminal spaces, like the little magic that is transposed from places like Fusion into the city, like Grismulle, like Ville de Renate, and, about blank and the clubs that are under threat of additional um, attack on liminality. So what is, how do we make a case or, you know, what do we do with urban planning and design 
to really uphold liminality as an essential part of like the beauty of messiness and humanity that can exist in a city or be eradicated. And is, is there like some sort of also concrete messaging that can be done in a more organized fashion so that we don't fuck everything up? Well, again, these are, I get the easy questions uh, at the end. So, well, Ivan, I'm sure that you yourself uh, have, have uh, some good responses to that. Um, each city, I'm not that familiar with Berlin. I've been here a few times, I've never lived here. Um, I had the good fortune of being here for the 10th anniversary, I believe it was, of the uh, fuck parade. Uh, and that was, I think, I'm not sure if that was the last fuck parade, but that was in, uh, I think it was in 2007, 2008, when that arena, which I think was called something else, was being built. And I think that the, that, that uh, parade, which is kind of like the, for those who don't know, is uh, the alternative uh, love parade, um, uh, drew attention to uh, uh, gentrification and uh, 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 the the you know the concreting over of uh, the underground. And I'm not really sure. And there's probably a lot of people in here who kn know more about the the evolution of uh, of uh, events like the Fuck Parade. But I, I believe that uh, public uh, parades are a very good way of drawing attention to. Um, uh, a, a, a morass of issues that uh, face people in this city, including um, uh, the uh, closing down of squats and, and uh, 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 you know, appropriate venues for performance and arts. I hope that answers some of, you, some of that. Thank you. One more last question here. Hi, uh, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, I'd like to uh, hear your opinion. Burning Man being a kind of a counterculture without actually being uh, explicitly anti-capitalist. Correct me if I'm wrong. Do you think this has, what does this have to do with the spread and success of Burning Man over the years, it being not anti-capitalist? Uh, yeah, you're right. It, it is. Uh, it, it, it's explicitly not anti-capitalist, uh, yet it is uh, decommodified. And, and I think that some people conflate uh, those two things. You can be, you can uh, engage in decommodification, but also engage in capitalism. Uh, it's an event that does not operate outside of the market. Um, it's certainly an event that grew uh, in conjunction with the the internet. And uh, so from, from the mid-90s, uh, you know, before the uh, dot-com dot bubble uh, burst, there, there was uh, a significant growth in that environment, which was invested in by a lot of people who saw the player as a kind of a physical uh, representation of uh, cyberspace. Um, but one of the interesting things that for me is that a lot of people who respond to this and resist this are people who've started uh, their own, uh, built their own communities, burner communities uh, around the world. Um, and a lot of the people who've been like emissaries from Burning Man and who've, uh, from their own countries who've uh, invested their lives and committed to building regional events have uh, responded to uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, the, the increasing presence of uh, affluence, uh, affluence in, into Burning Man and the injection of, uh, of wealth in Burning Man. So ultimately it's not, it, it's not a phenomenon that where there's one easy overriding uh, conclusion or definition because each time someone comes up with an understanding of what they think Burning Man is all about, uh, there's always another, there's always another, you know, view, and I think that's reflected in the uh, the main ritual itself, the the burning of an effigy, where the the Burning Man project do not provide uh, a, an explanation for that. They do not provide a, a definition. It's uh, 
uh, you, you are invited to assign your own meaning to it. And uh, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank, thanks. From here, from the front. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for your talk. I'm wondering how you differentiate with the burner communities that you say are have sort of branched out around the world, um, the commodification of these sort of cultural appropriations where, you know, the burning of the effigy, for example, it's like that exists in prior in many cultures around the world. Um, and so, the sort of the branding of Burning Man, um, bringing it around the world, how do you differentiate between existing uh, rituals and festivals or, you know, celebrations and the Burning Man? Well, first of all, I don't think anyone has sort of ownership over uh, the burning of, of an effigy. Uh, it's very, very much an archetypal, uh, cathartic performance. Um, the, the Burning Man organi organization do attempt uh, to retain copyright over symbols and um, phrases such that they don't, generally don't allow regional events to use the word Burning Man. Uh, and they, for purposes of uh, you know, preventing exploitation uh, of uh, core symbols like the symbol of the man. They do, uh, they do establish copyright over that. I'm not sure if that's, the, that's what you were asking, but um, there, there, there is, uh, um, they, they do have, you know, they have lawyers and uh, efforts to prevent that from happening. I'm just wondering what they provide that other existing kind of events and, you know, communities don't. Um, yeah, I'm still not sure what okay. the question is. I don't know if I um, can phrase it. Per perhaps we can have a chat afterwards where you can rephrase it. Okay, I think Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions. So we have a short break now, and we will follow up with a panel discussion in 10 minutes. Graham, thank you so much once again for your perfect presentation. Thank you. Thank you.